Okay, <laughs> Donna. Tell us what happened to you today. Okay, dirty praise and worship. Okay, you, you gotta talk about. Dirty praise and worship. <laughs> I was worshiping and stuff, and I had my eyes closed, and I had a vision, and what I saw was like, like big words. Well, at first I was like, I saw a black dragon like wrapping around me, and then I was like, yeah, you got. And then I saw a big, bold word, and it said faith, and it was like black though. I was like, I don't want it to be black. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it turned into bright, and it was like a golden light and stuff. And it shot down into me, and I started gagging. <laughs> so I went to the restroom and I threw up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you guys think happened? Yeah. What do you think that big dragon went? In the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, yeah, it left, but sometimes stuff is really I think a lot of times when generational stuff comes out, you want to throw up because it's deep inside. It just affects, it's just an effect on your body. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to throw up if you get delivered, but it does affect your body, certain spirits, okay? So everybody, thank God for. Are you guys glad you got? Yes. I'm glad. <laughs> I am very excited to get the opportunities to teach and to be with y'all today. And I'm really excited because the lesson that the Lord placed in my heart is something that He's really been teaching me through this season as well. And it's about being the light to the world. And so we hear the phrase, be the salt and the light, a lot in church. And really recently, God's been giving me a revelation to the extent of what it means. Um, the last time I talked, yeah, I talked about how I was choosing law schools and transitioning in my life. And a couple of weeks ago, I actually went to go visit the law school that um, I'm going to, and it's in Houston. Yeah. And I'm really excited, but as I was going there, um, what really blessed me is that when I was talking to the people at law school about how it works, it's that they put us in each little section, and it's like, Everybody in that section takes the same class, and you're with them all the time. And they told me that the, your reputation in law school carries out into your work field because there's only so many lawyers in Houston. And as we go into the work field in the future, we'll run into each other. So they say who you are in law school really makes an impressionable memory on people. So they're like, try to be nice and stuff. But that made me really excited because as I'm transitioning to the season, and God's placing me in a new environment. He's giving me an opportunity to really be a light into the world. And uh, I remember on my birthday, the very first time I started coming to BBC, um, I went to a prayer meeting at Young's house. And this is when I like didn't really know everyone yet. And Stephen had a word of um, um, a word for me, and he said that I was going to be fishers of men, but in the work field. And so I mean, I like wrote it down in my journal, and I was like, that's really cool and stuff. But it didn't really hit me until I toured my law school that this is where God's calling me to. And this is where it's also my like missionary and my ministry field. And that the people that I'm going to meet there, I'm going to impact their lives and show them who Christ really is. And so God really placed on my heart that sharing the gospel verbally is one form. But living it and being the light is another. And a lot of us, we believe in God because of the experiences that we've had with Him. It's not, it's more than just going to church and reading the Bible, but it's when you really have an encounter with God. And so when we tell people about it, they hear it, but they haven't yet experienced it yet. But one of the first ways for them to really experience who God is and the extent of God's love is their interactions with us and how we interact with them. And that becomes an experience for them of, oh, if this person is a Christian and this person loves God, they really have something different about them. And so this lesson, it's, um, the verse is Matthew 5, 13 to 15. And if y'all are there. Yes. <laughs> Kevin, you want to read it? Okay. Uh, Loud. To 16, 13 to 16. Yeah. All right. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under, underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so that's kind of like the key verse of what I'm going to be speaking on. I'm going to be referring to it a lot throughout the lessons that you and I put a bookmark there or whatnot. But this is talking about being the light, to be put on a lampstand, to be shined for all who are in the house and who are in the world. And so I really want to talk about why is it necessary to even be the light? Why does God call us to be the light? And why it's required more than just to have a relationship with God, but is to have a relationship with people too. And the whole reason to be the light is because the point of Christianity, the whole foundation of it is God's compassion for us. That when God looked down and saw um, the world and how broken the people were, he sent his son down because of the compassion that he had. And when Jesus was on this world, he had compassion for the people and for us, and that's why he died on the cross. And so we talk about being the light, but if we don't have compassion for others, then we don't really get the point of being the light. And so in Matthew 9, um, 35, uh, this is when Jesus was in Nazareth. And I'll just read this verse. It goes, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers out to the harvest. And so, when I read that passage, Jesus was going through all these cities, healing, delivering, and bringing people to the fullness that God intends us to be. And part of it isn't that he was just doing it because his Father commanded him to, but he was moved with compassion. And so, for me, before I was truly saved, I mean, I went, most of y'all know my testimony, but I was, went to church, was born in the church, did church things, was a church leader, led, like, led VBS, did all these great works. But I was so broken, and I had this void that um, was so big, it wasn't like seen, like it was just normal. And that's how the world is, and I hope at one point, you know, y'all have realized the void without Jesus. But once you realize that and you look, at the world and you look at your friends, people are so desperate and are so hungry for God. And in our society, we fill it up with um, friends, with partying, with music, and we become so desensitized to what we really need. And it's every person's been created to desire and to need to be loved by God. Like that is the ultimate source of love. And people seek for that, you see, in relationships and other in their friends. And they're trying to fill this void because they're so broken. And people are also so desperate to know. I mean, here we're extremely blessed because Stephen and our leaders and Chrissy teach us who God is and who God intends us to be. But a lot of people never hear that they have self-worth. And a lot of people never hear that... Um, they actually have a father who loves them. And so when we're the light, we are moved with compassion because everywhere we go, in our schools, in our work, in our everywhere, there are people who are so hungry for love. And it's only when we realize that, when we have compassion for them, that we are moved to be the light and we are moved to love them. And um, once we increase in compassion, I remember once I was talking to Stephen about something. I was like, yeah, I just wish I had more compassion. He says, compassion comes from when you dwell in the Lord. And once you receive the love from God and you overflow, then that's the way that you love people. Because on our own, we can't love one another fully. And on our own, we are naturally selfish, naturally prideful, and we naturally don't want to fully love people, but only through being with God that we can really have compassion for others. And so part of, um, a lot of y'all are transitioning, and, you know, graduating high school or going through different things in life, but I pray that when you meet new people, um, 
as much as it sucks to have to make new friends in a sense, but to have compassion for them and to have compassion for the people who have yet to discover the fullness of God. And this was actually um, a verse that Pastor Khan preached on last week. It was Luke 4, 16 through 29. Um, and I'll read it. And this is Jesus. So he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he was, yeah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so, this really struck me because a lot of American Christian culture is about sharing the gospel verbally which is fantastic and it's great. But the commission that we have been um, asked by the Lord is to be the light. And that means to go and to heal people who are hurting through not just deliverance, but through how we treat them and how we love them. And how to set the people who are oppressed free. And a lot of that is the actions and what we do. And so being the light really means that people can see the God that is within us the Holy Spirit moving. Um, if we walk in love and integrity, people will notice that. We can walk around saying, I'm a Christian and I go to church and these are the things I do, which will sound good, but that cliche that actions speak louder than words is most definitely true. And in order to see whether or not, I guess to measure whether or not we are really being the light is to see how much of our lives that we're in purity. And we talk about purity as like sexual purity, which is totally true. That is a must. But there's also emotional purity. The things that we hold on to our lives, the things that we value, if it's up here and God's down here, then that's something that's not right either. And so that's a whole other thing in and of itself. But in Galatians 5.16, it's talking 5.16 and 23, those are the verses about um, the fruits of the Spirit. And we're all like, oh yeah, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Great, and then the, but the verses before that talk about the works of the flesh, which it says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentiousness, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, hearsays, envy, murder, drunkenness, reveries, and of the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the time past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So it says very clearly things that God has commanded us not to have in our lives. And those things, if are present in our lives, the fruits of the Spirit will be unable to prosper. And so, I was thinking of fruits of the Spirit. Tree. We name a tree by its fruit. An apple tree has apples. And we can call a tree an apple tree as much as we want, but if we never see any apples, then it's just a plant. But what's worse, what's worse is that if we call it an apple tree and it produces bananas, then we are clearly foolish and kidding ourselves. And that's kind of how it is as well. If we don't have the fruits of the Spirit, like love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, then what fruits do we have in our life? And I was thinking about it. Um, the tree, that's us. We need water, the spirit, and the sun, the word to grow, and also fertilize it, which I believe is like fellowship, to help us in our growth. But when we produce bad fruit, it's not those, it's not just us that is affected. It's those in our lives who mistake our apples that are actually bananas, and they take that into their life. 
So as Christians, when we go around proclaiming that we love the Lord and we're here to worship Him and He's the center of our universe and, oh, everything is, you know, I give it to you, Lord, and everything is for you, God. And not only does God hear your promises, but those around you hear that as well. And once that doesn't match up to the fruit that you're producing, then people either A, start having a bad opinion about Christians or believe that the person isn't genuine. And so Fu was telling me, if y'all have um, heard Fu's testimony, he was an atheist before he became a Christian. And he hated Christians, hated them. And the reason why he said he hated them is because he said they were hypocrites. Because he was like, these people tell me I'm going to hell. They drink and they curse and they do all these things. And he was just like, Psh, I live a great life. And these people think that they have the right to tell me I'm going to hell. And that really convicted me. Because although I don't, you know, go out and party, but there are things in my life and how I treat people that sometimes do not reflect Christ. And so my, my prayer is that wherever y'all go, you remember that you carry the name of Christ with you. And just as we sing that there is power in the name of Christ, there is a power when you proclaim that you are a Christian and you walk in it as well. And so when people look into our lives, if we say that we give everything to God, but what we do is contradictory, or when our leaders tell us something and we know that it's the truth, but we choose not to obey it. If we choose to disobey them, then there is such a discrepancy in our lives that either you are bearing no fruit or not good fruit at all. And so, being the light is a commission in and of itself. To be transparent, to have compassion. And in Philippians 2, 14 to 16, um, Paul writes, do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. And so there it writes that we may be blameless and harmless children of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. So if there was a crooked and perverse generation thousands of years ago, just imagine how worse it's now. <laughs> and where we're at in our lives, in our school, as we look around, we see that society glorifies completely opposite things. When on the radios, the songs that they're playing, the catchy beats that they have, but the things that they are idolizing, which is always seems to be sex of some sort, relationships of some sort, drugs, money. I just, it's very difficult for me to um, understand that when we put those things into our lives, we also reflect those things in our life. Whatever you put into you is shown throughout you. It's like if you eat a cheeseburger, you'll probably notice it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but just like whatever you eat spiritually, it's going to be shown throughout. And so God commands us to be blameless and harmless so that the people, not just for ourselves, first of all, for ourselves, it is great to walk in the Spirit, to walk in intimacy with God, to have relationship with Him, but also for the people in our lives. Because once we, once our will and God's will lines up, we are to have compassion. And if we don't live a life of holiness and of, sanct like of sanctification, then we can't reach out to those people. And if we can't reach out to those people, it's because we don't want to. And if we don't want to, it's because we don't have compassion for them. And But what is great, though, is that if we do have compassion, and we do take charge, and we do want to live a blameless, holy life to be the light, then the effect that we have is so vast. So, so, so vast. 
Because in the first verse that I mentioned, Matthew 5, 13, the key phrase there, I think, that says, nor do they put a light lamp and put it, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Now, how many of y'all have people in your family who aren't saved? The great thing that what God says is when we are the light, we will provide light, give light to all who are in the house. Um, for my family, when I really was began to walk in the Spirit, they look back and they see the change. They see the change in me of how I respect and honor my parents, how I will apologize to my brothers if I do something wrong, and how I will make an effort to tell them I love them every single day because they see that change and they see that I have sowed into them and sowed into my family. And through that change that I have been transformed by God, and it's a continual process, guys, but, um, <laughs> um, but through that, they, they see and they know that where I go, where I worship, where I am, they're teaching me the right thing. And so for y'all who have family members who aren't saved, when they see the way you treat them, the way you respect them, how you honor them, how you love them, how you speak life into them, people will notice that. Spiritually, they'll feel it. And they'll begin to wonder, who is this God Anthony serves? Who is this God Alice serves? You know, Is he really real? Because once they see the change, like I was saying, once they see that experience and that transformation in another person's life, then they're going to wonder. And from there, God's going to be able to move and work into their heart. And it's kind of like, with your any life examples, if you tell your friends like, "Hey, I have this. I know this product, and it works really, really well, and it's supposed to do all these things that it promises, like give you, you know, peace and truth and hope and all these things," but when you when you have it in your life, it doesn't produce any of those things. Your friends are just going to be like, "Well, it must obviously not do what you advertise." So when we talk. To our friends, post on Facebook and go on Twitter and all these things about this God who is supreme and this God who heals and God who saves. Make sure in our lives that reflects it, because it's gonna catch their ear and they're gonna be like, "Oh, really? That's cool. Well, show me the effects. Show me the fruit of it." And once we live that blameless life, we're able to not only transform our household and get the people that we love saved, but we can transform nations and schools and workplaces. And um, that really, 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 really awesome to me is, and I was reading in Genesis about the story of Joseph. So this is like Genesis 37 to 40, 30. It's important, so you got like five chapters, you know? <laughs> but basically, the story of Joseph, um, if y'all want to read it yourselves and just really study the word and ask God to reveal to you different things. But Joseph, um, he was the, the man with a coat of many colors that his father gave to him. And he had dreams of like, basically saying that his father and his brothers would bow to him, basically, that he would be um, a ruler. And, of course, he went and told his brothers, and they didn't take that very well. So, any normal family, they sold him into slavery. <laughs> and he was sold into slavery, and he became a slave in an Egyptian's house. So here he is over here, his father's favorite son, with a coat of many colors. And then now he's here, beaten, sold into slavery, and made some heathen slave. And so this huge transition, God bless you, um, but when God gave, that's what God's preaching, when, when God gave Joseph that visions, he held on to them. 
he truly believed in them. And how many of us have gotten words before about our future and about our destiny? And it sounds really good. You're like, oh, I'll transform nations. Cool. I'll go to these countries. Like, I'll be a you know missionary artist. And it sounds good. And sometimes we write it down in our journals, and we, you know, kind of forget about it. But the things that God promises us are true. And Joseph truly, truly believed in it. And because he believed in it, his life conformed to purity as well. Um, but before getting into that, just remember, guys, that the things that God has commissioned to you will come to fruit. They will come to pass. Because Joseph had these dreams, and everything in his life didn't really add up to it. But in the end, it did. But talking about because he believed in those dreams, because he believed in who God was calling him to be, he chose a life of um, holiness. He was a light and purity as well. Part of um, when he was taken into the Egyptian's house, his master's wife tempted him and was like, hey, Joseph, come over here and sleep with me. And it was, says that she was a beautiful woman, and he resisted her a bunch of times. And the reason why he did that is because he was committed. He was committed to being pure. He was committed to glorifying God. And he was committed because he knew what God had in store for him. And unfortunately, as the story goes, his, uh, his master's wife basically lied and told his master that he was trying to tempt her so that he gets thrown into jail. So things for Joseph not working out very well at all. But as he was in the Egyptian's house, it says um, in the first 39, verse 1 through 5, around there, it says, um, Now Joseph was taken out of Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him and took him there. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then the Egyptian made him overseer of his house. All that he had, he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he made Joseph overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and the field. So Joseph, this slave, was the light. And when he went and was, not went, when he was forced to be a slave, he was still who God called him to be. And because of that, he transformed a household. Because of that, the Lord blessed an Egyptian's household from just the house and the field. And so we joke around, we're like, whenever we go to a restaurant and then like there's a super long line behind us and we're like, we bring the blessings. <laughs> but we do, but more ways than that. When we step into an environment, the Lord's favor is with us. And we completely change that situation and that environment to be and to conform into the way God wants it to be. And so this isn't just a one-time thing. Once Joseph was sold into, um, once Joseph got persecuted for that unfair crime, um, he was thrown into jail. And as he was in jail, same thing happened. It says uh, in verse like 21 through 22, it goes, and Joseph continued to do, no way, just kidding, 40. No. Scrap that. Verses again. Basically, as he was in prison, um, he found favor, and he became basically like a prison guard. He became over all the other prisoners. And once again, he stepped into a place of darkness, a place of brokenness, a literal prison. <laughs> a literal prison. <laughs> And got elevated because of the light. And while he was there, oh, as we hear a baker and a cupbearer came, and they had these dreams. And they're like, we don't know what it means. And Joseph did the work of God and interpreted those dreams. And as the story progressed, 
because he interpreted dream correctly, he was later brought to the pharaoh to interpret the pharaoh's dreams. So here he goes from coat of many colors to servant to uh, to yeah to slave to prisoner, and now in the pharaoh's house. So in the pharaoh's house, the pharaoh has these dreams, and Joseph correctly interprets them. And so the pharaoh is like, "Ah, oh, you're so awesome! Like, be my right hand man." And as Joseph was second in command to Pharaoh, he transformed a nation. Okay, because of he because of God's presence in his life, he interpreted the dreams correctly, and was able to basically store up provisions for a seven year famine. Okay. <laughs> A seven-year famine. And out of that, because he was faithful to God, because he walked in that righteousness that God called him, the Lord blessed him and blessed an entire nation. And through blessing that entire nation, later on Joseph's family was able to have food and have provisions. And so as we go into different Parts and stages and transition in life, whether it be at church or at school, if we are unhappy with the situation and unhappy with the people there, we can change that. We can change it because of just who we are and who God called us to be. And a lot of y'all are going to different schools, and so I'm excited for you guys because it's a new season and it's a new environment to sow and love and to really impact people and for me I'm like yay law school I'm also like oh I'm so nervous I'm going to this completely new place I'm going to have to make completely new friends school is going to be ten times harder all of, all of these things but I remind myself that my whole purpose that I've been commissioned to be is to just be the light. To show people who God is through my actions and my words. And through that, everything falls into place for me and for you and for anybody else who takes that commission seriously. And so wherever y'all go, um, whoever you meet, really remember um, to be the light, to show people love in order for people to understand the love that God's poured into us. And what's great here is because we have people like Stephen, Christy, Andy, and Twin, or and me, and anyone really, that is so open to listening to one another and praying for one another. That any time being a, the light or being a Christian is difficult, and often it will be. Um, they're here, we're here, interchangeably, um, to listen and to pray and to also be the light in y'all's lives and to sow into love into y'all as well. And so I guess, um, my prayer really is that if there are any areas in your life where you feel like it's not producing good fruit, or any areas in your life where um, you want more good fruit to be produced, I definitely could use more patience, <laughs> long suffering. Yeah. I pray that, yes, yeah, self control, that's, that's good as well. <laughs> I pray that y'all. Um, Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the things, the more the fruits that you need, as well as the fruits, the bad fruits that need to be removed. And I pray that you'll have compassion for your friends, the compassion for the people in your life, even the super annoying ones, okay? <laughs> that God allows you to see them in a lens of the desperation of your heart, their brokenness, their oppression, so that when you treat them, you treat them with love and honor and respect and that way wherever we go here that we transform our city that our schools that our classrooms that we um, even at our church um, for those who come here if there are people that you don't like 
or friends that you haven't made, or things that you would like to change. Um, change comes from prayer and the life that we live. Just if Joseph could, if Joseph could transform his master's house, a prison, and a Egyptian that was not, or an Egyptian nation that was not godly, then God can surely use us to transform our churches, our schools, the city of Houston. And so I pray that, um, kind of like what Pastor Khan was preaching about, to have that warrior spirit, to know that you have been commissioned and that you can change and that you believe of the destiny and the visions and the words that God has blessed you with. And so I know this was a really quick message, um, but hopefully I got some things out of it. And um, Stephen? Are you guys done? <clears throat> okay. Um, I won't say anything. I, I won't go. Um, I won't be long. I'm just going to close. There's a scripture. I don't know where it is, but it says, "If the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness?" To be the light, we truly have to deal with the darkness first. That's already in us and the darkness that we allow in us. And we, we call it, well, it's called compromise, but we tolerate it. It's the same thing. If you tolerate, you compromise. And um, one of the reasons why we are being mocked is that we tolerate too much darkness as Christians. And the gospel has been watered down to make it easy for our flesh and... Uh, we have to realize that uh, the only way to life is to do everything that Jesus says without any excuses. Because making an excuse is really, you know, the word for that, the only word I can think of is, is really rebellion. But we actually say it's okay to rebel against someone who laid down his life in blood to ravish his love on us even when we were his enemies. How can we do that and still say it's okay? That's, I can tell you why we do that, because the darkness that's already in us. The only reason we compromise is the darkness that deceives us that's already within us. You guys understand what I'm saying? So, how many want to make a commitment to say, God, I want to live in total response to your word, and if there is darkness in me, I would do whatever it takes to get it out, because I don't want to live in darkness and think that I'm a children of light, or a child of light, and, and I don't want to be deceived, and I don't want to deceive people, and I want to deceive myself. How many guys say that? I don't know how I, this is just what's coming out of me. I'm not making a message or anything. Um, another thing is, I do know that uh, that sometimes sometimes we feel like, am I ever going to change? Because I've done this over and over. And I said, I went to the altar and I said that I wouldn't do this again, but I still did it. I... I I, I don't think I have the power to change. I know what I did was wrong, but I keep doing it. How many guys have been there? Okay. Why do I keep listening to that song and I know it's just filling me with darkness? Why do I do that? Or, or why do I say what I say knowing it's wrong? Or why do I go places I know that I shouldn't? Or why do I keep compromising the little things? And the Bible tells me that little foxes spoil the vineyard. Why do I keep doing that? Why? Why, why, why? I really believe it, it's a lack of revelation of God's love and burning desire and passion and His consuming fire to take over our lives and take complete control because it is best that way that God takes complete control. And when you come to that place where you realize it, if I'm in control of my life, it will suck. Everybody agree with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I have to relinquish all control. My mind will try to reason with what's best for me, but I have to come to the place where I say, I don't know what's best for me. Only God does. You guys hear what I'm saying? How many of you go here and say, I don't really know what's best for me? I'm a pastor. I've been doing ministry for 12 years, I think, you know, and I don't know what's best for me. Sometimes I think of God. And I'll tell you what, after 12 years, after a lot of experience, and seeing, I don't know, countless of people healed, delivered, saved, seeing the power of God, seeing people, seeing eyes open, ears open, and all kinds of stuff. There's so many times I go, I don't know what to do, God. I really don't know what's best for me. I need help. I'm broken, I'm weak, and I'm just... I'm in need, God. I just, I don't, I can't live without you. I'm, I'm lost. And I need your presence. You know what the truth is? You guys know so much Bible truth already. Reason why you can't is that lack, it, it's really, we feel, when we feel far away from God, we just do what we think is right. But when we're close to Him and His presence is 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 tangible and you know it's easy. But I want to tell you guys this. Even when you can't feel his presence, even when he seems so far away, and you you want to do what's wrong, you want to do your own thing, it is a simple act of your will. Who had that dream of uh, Willie? Willie? Willie was getting her in trouble. And she's like, what does this mean? I said, your will is getting you in trouble. And the, the thing is, guys, there are times when God will hide himself from you so you can learn to exercise your will and do what the Word says. So what you want to listen to that song? So what if everybody likes that song? If there's lust, sensuality, if there's darkness in it, and you're listening to it, you worship the wrong God, and you come to church, and you say you want to worship Jesus, he'll call it lip service, and you think the whole time you're giving God good worship, he's like, until you repent, you're just giving me lip service, son, daughter. I know what you said yesterday. Why don't you just come and tell me that you want to get rid of this? You know? Confess it to somebody and just get it out of you. You understand what I'm saying? So, God not confused, only we are, huh? Let's stand to our feet. Now, on Friday, Christy had a vision. Why don't you share that? So on Friday, I saw, um, I was worshiping and I was praying through some things for me. And then after that, um, all of a sudden, over my sight, eyes open, um, I saw on the upper corner of it, I saw these hearts. And um, the outline of the hearts was in light blue, which I call that Holy Spirit blue because of a dream I had a way long time ago. But it's kind of like Dell computer blue. There's these outlines of hearts. And I, I felt like the reason it was outlined is because God made a place for it. Um, God had, had put it that it should be there. But the problem was that inside of the heart, it was pink. Instead of love, pink to me represents lust, right? Which doesn't always mean sexual lust, but it can be jealousy, anger, all kinds of fleshly. Self-promotion. Yeah, self-promotion. All kind of... Pride of life. Pride of life. Yeah. Things, <laughs> desires for, for things could be mammon, could be anything that you kind of lust after it and it's not, it's not right. Covetousness. Covetousness, yes. So anyway, um, the heart was there, so there was a place that, that God had made for love. But in this cluster of hearts, the hearts were upside down, and they were pink. And so I remembered after that something that Stephen taught me not terribly long ago, that anywhere that there should be love and there's an absence of love, then that gives a place for lust. Okay, come here. Let me give you an example. Okay, so say crystal, okay? If I truly love Crystal, 
then I'm not going to be jealous of her just because she has like the coolest outfit on today, right? If, if I have real love for her, then love will overcome any anger. Sorry, did I just have to? Any kind of anger, like if she does something wrong and it, it upsets me because I feel like either she, she doesn't get me or like something, whatever. If there's something amiss in our relationship, it's because of a lack of love in an area, either perceived, so it would be on one side, I feel like she doesn't love me, so I'm going to be jealous of her. I feel like she doesn't love me, she didn't pay attention to me, she didn't notice me, so I'm going to be angry at her, or, or whatever. Or if there's an area of our relationship where there's, there's some kind of ungodly thing and a lack of love, like something that we've done together, or something, whatever, that there's a place that that place doesn't have love, then that's a place that doesn't have God in our relationship, because God is love. So if, if our relationship is full of God, it will be full of love. If there's something amiss, then it creates a hole for some kind of lust to come in, whether that be anger, jealousy, strife, ambition, I don't know, whatever it could be, right? So either in our cluster of hearts, you know, there's, there's places where love has gotten turned upside down, and so in that spot, there's something that's not of God. Does that make sense? It's turned upside down. Those hearts represent us. It's a cluster. It's turned upside down. The God of this age has a master plan to pervert love. You guys know that. Everybody needs love. So he gives us the counters. And uh, if you uh, go to school and go, go outside, you you see all the counterfeits of love, right? Mm -hmm. All these counterfeits. Um, even, even sometimes, you know, parents that, here's another example, is that parents that uh, don't have time for their kids, so they buy them stuff. Mm -hmm. Just, here. I love you, but I don't have time for you. Here, here, take some money and go buy yourself something. That is not love. They actually love themselves and their material possessions, whatever, that we're working so hard for. And uh, if that's your case, you might need to forgive your parents. They gave you an upside down heart that's pink. Do you get what I'm saying? If your friends uh, have done that to you, and you need to forgive your friends. And here's the other upside down heart is the, the love that is so controlling and it doesn't trust, it doesn't believe, it doesn't hope, is, is when somebody really, in human sense, cares about you, but just wants to control you. Just will not, out of fear or whatever, pride, just thinks that if you, if they don't have control of your life, now I'm not saying that your parents shouldn't have a say in what you do. I'm not saying that. But I'm talking about the extremity of that. That is not the kind of love that will build you up. It'll all actually ultimately uh, oppress you. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? Okay. These are just some of the things. But um, I guess we'll pray for any one of you guys who feel like, you know, I've gotten this wrong kind of love from people. And it didn't help me. It actually caused my heart to grow cold. And uh, I realized that the only kind of love that will help me is the kind that uh, is patient, kind, hopes, believes. The kind that you find in First Corinthians 13. <laughs> anyway, Lord, would you... Show us what love is. How do you guys know the light is simply the love we show for one another? God is light. God is love. God is truth. Holy Spirit, would you raise a people that would prefer each other before even themselves? Anytime you feel like you want to compare yourself to somebody, quote that scripture. The Bible says, you know, we ought to prefer a brother even above ourselves. Tell that to yourself. Say, God, I'm going to do what you say. 
You get jealous of somebody? Lord, bless that person. Give them more than you give me, God. You know? <laughs> you want something that somebody has? <laughs> it's called covet. covetousness. You covet their stuff. Say, Lord, bless them with some more stuff, Lord. Whatever, you know? Lord, or somebody has a gift, like a, a spiritual gift or a gift to sing. Somebody sings real well and you're jealous or whatever. Say, God, let them sing even better, God. You know? Start praying the opposite spirit. Kill that stinking flesh. See what happens to you. Deny this, this, that's the lust of the flesh thing, you know? That's the upside down heart. That's the wrong stuff. <laughs> I tell you, um, we all have some of that, right? I, I'll tell you, I, sometimes my flesh rises up. I have to like run in the closet and cry, God help me. <laughs> I don't want to love this person. I know I have to, but it's hard. Help! Ah! You know, I'm screaming. I need help, you know. Maybe some of you guys are... Um, are you guys glad she's still alive? Yes. yes. And, um, <laughs> Just kidding. I don't know, like, why... She I'm doesn't gonna... purposely look down on us. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so... Well, I was in the hospital. Like, it gave me, like, a lot of time to think and reflect about like my life and um, before then there was a lot of things that happened in my house so when all that stuff happened I kind of went like I just didn't want to think about anything like I just went like in the opposite direction of God and I was just like you know it really messed me up so while I was in the hospital I was just like really reflecting and I was like you know I had to really pray and um, and then God started revealing a lot of stuff to me in my life, and, oh, God started revealing a lot of things to me in my life, um, things that I've been doing wrong, and, like, you know, how I've been taking his position in a lot of my friends' lives, and how I should, like, kind of, like, let them, you know, do that, and um, the whole time I was in the hospital, it was like, it just gave me so much time to spend with God, and, like, you know, nobody bothered me, like, by telling me alone, like, everybody left, left me alone, and, um, yeah, so I was spending all that time with him. Like he, he revealed a lot of stuff to me, and um, and then I had this, I had this one dream that I forgot that like God let me remember a couple nights ago, and he, uh, it was like, well, recently I've been really praying for my brother to get saved, and my brother started going to this church, and I'm like, hmm, I don't know about that church. So I went last night and I checked it out for myself. And uh, I was like, okay, they're okay and stuff. And I remember this one dream I had where my brother was like, um, I had this, my friend just gave me this necklace that has a cross on it. And he stole it from me. That's the it was just like he took it out of my room. And then I saw him with it on. I'm like, what are you doing with my cross, with my necklace? Like, I was like, what are you doing with it? And he was like, oh, well, since I've been going to church, I thought I should like, you know, kind of take some of your church stuff. And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, well, it's literal. yeah, and I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, well, um, <laughs> if I wear your cross, you know, that might bring me it's a little a closer way. to God. I was like, what? Okay. Like, that doesn't make sense. Okay. Well, let me tell you about the symbolism of that, okay? The cross speaks of self-sacrifice, laying down your life. It speaks of denying self. Yeah. It speaks of dying to your will. Mm -hmm. Okay, the fact that you have chosen that, he saw your cross and he took it. That means he's going to do the same thing. And the necklace, the next speaks of obedience in this case. It could speak of rebellion in the wrong way. Because okay? mm -hmm. the Bible talks about stiff-necked people, which speaks of rebellion. But in this case, it was a necklace that speaks of obedience. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I, can, I can speak a word of encouragement over you. I feel like the Lord is telling you that your obedience and your willingness to lay down your life and sacrifice yourself has spoken to your brother. And because of that, oh man, I feel it. Somebody lay hands on her. Because of that, the the light that you sure you sure uh, shown has pierced through his darkness, and he has come to the light. Bless you, and may you even do more so. Thank you. And then lay hands on the young lady next to you. Yeah. Well, why don't you stand to your feet? If you, just lay hands on her. Just lay, you guys stretch your hands here. 
Lord, would you reveal a heart of a father that is perfect, that is kind, that is patient, that knows no evil, that doesn't accuse, that doesn't find fault, but Lord, that is open, that approaches her with arms wide open to pick her up, even in her weakness, in her brokenness, in the things that the enemy tries to shame her with. But would you reveal yourself to her as a, an endless heartbeat to reach out to her in her darkest hour, Lord. Thank you right now. God, would you take away the loneliness and, and the things that she feels in her life that uh, she doesn't want anybody to even hear about it. But Lord, would you cover all that up and would you right now reach into her heart and show her how how much you've been thinking about her and how much Lord you desire to and how committed you are to restoring her life and to showing her that she means the world to you. Would you come right now? So wait, do I just ask the Lord, Lord manifest your love. Let her feel it now. Thank you, Lord. What are you, what are you smiling about? Huh? Did I embarrass you? Didn't mean to. Huh? So how many guys have how many guys used to feel God's presence and you felt like for a season God just forgot your address? Huh? I'm telling you, he did not forget your address. Okay? There are always seasons where he will allow you to make decisions of, of your will. So you can grow. You can grow strong. Okay? Good. <laughs> now what? <laughs> okay, Anthony. Okay, let's 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 go back to that. Okay, anybody in here? Anybody in here that fears God and not man that says, I have compromised with some decisions in my life and um, I want to confess it right now and I want to get it out of my life and I want to ask God to forgive me. If, you, that, if that's you, just stand to your feet. What if you wanted to and you didn't? Yeah, you can still stand. Whatever the area is, there's no condemnation here. If you're embarrassed to stand up, that's compromising. Stand up. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Don't let the fear of man cause you to compromise. Okay. Okay, I want you to tell the person next to you what the compromise is. Wait. Confess it out of your mouth. Esther, you can tell Anthony or anybody you choose to. Or you can tell me. If it's a, if it's some bad music, you need to tell that person the name of the song and renounce that song. All the songs? Break your CD. <laughs> Christy broke mine. Yeah. <laughs> if you guys are addicted. <laughs> Can we just like renounce I, I will tell you what. There is a musician right now. 
There's a musician right now that's very popular. And he has such a demonic anointing that you can get addicted to his music like that. Skrillex. Drake. If you've listened to Drake and you haven't confessed it, you are in big trouble. Drake. Drake. That guy has a very strong anointing, not from God. Kimmy. Kimmy. You need to come here. Why? Yeah, there's a spirit behind there. Okay, I want you to pronounce their sins forgiven. If they confess it to you, just say, in the name of Jesus, I pronounce, look at them and tell them, I pronounce your sins forgiven. What? Pronounce your sins forgiven. And wait, 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 wait. Another thing is, okay? Another thing is, tell them, ask them right now, do you forgive yourself? No, what's wrong with you? Say yes, I forgive myself. And here's what you guys say, okay? Do you forgive yourself? Just say, in the name of Jesus, self-condemnation, self-hatred, must go. <laughs> oh, don't underestimate what you just did, even though it sounds like it's okay. I thought you were I was like, so, <laughs> Okay. okay, guys, guys, let's get back to this. Who cares? Okay, you guys done yet? <laughs> okay, all those people that were just getting prayer, I want you to stand up again. Spirit man, rise. If you just got, if you've been praying about the compromise, I want you to stand on your feet again. I want to do something right now. Okay. This is, I, I want to say I'm proud of you guys. I, I need everybody be uh, be quiet if you're not getting prayer. Okay. I, I want I want to say I'm proud of you guys. <laughs> And I believe that God's proud of you. But that is what it's called coming out of darkness into the light, okay? When you confess your sins. But I'm going to, right now, I'm just going to simply take authority over everything that you've just confessed, okay? And if, if there's any spirit behind it, I want to take authority over it right now, okay? And uh, you guys do it with me, okay? So Lord, we thank you for the power of your presence here. We thank you for the name of Jesus. And Lord, as uh, the head of this house, I speak to every demon that tries to claim rights to any of these ones that have confessed their sins. In Jesus' name, I command you to leave. Get off of them now. When you've broken your legal rights, you will not trespass in the name of Jesus. You will get out of this place. In the name of Jesus. Now I want to tell you guys something. If these things come back and knock on your door and ask you to compromise, no. what are you going to say? No, no. Yeah. Use go the name of Jesus. Jesus. Don't just say go away, okay? If it's a demon, it will not respond to your loud voice. It responds to the name of Jesus. You have to say in Jesus' name, leave, okay? Use the name Jesus. You don't have to talk loud. You don't have to scream. Sometimes I do because I'm just angry. I just hate these people. Now everybody just say, Lord, I renounce compromise forever. I renounce compromise forever. No compromise. No toleration. Jezebel ain't gonna influence you. 
Jezebel, you suck. 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 How many guys know the spirit of Elijah is stronger than the spirit of Jezebel? That's the Holy Spirit, okay? If you will commune with the Holy Spirit, ain't no Jezebel gonna mess with you. If they do, you just have no Alright? Jezzy must go. I don't want to know where that was. Okay, I'm gonna why don't we stand to our feet? I'm gonna close this. Catherine um, told her mom that she's no longer Catholic. And her mom isn't so happy. Okay, I'm just gonna be straight. Uh, not all Catholics, but many of them turn off that camera. Huh? No, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm, I was like, okay. Many of them pray to Mary, who's dead. She's in heaven, but that's not the person they're praying to. They're praying to a spirit called the Queen of Heaven. You'll find two places in the Bible. And this is the same spirit that um, is in a lot of different religions, okay? But she is, she, he, there's no gender, but, but it's a feminine type of spirit, okay? But uh, it's really a Jezebel spirit. Okay, Jezebel is not just a demon, it's a diabolical, spiritual entity that pretty much has encompassed the earth, okay, and, and reigns over many realms of society, okay, and within certain, like, within the Catholic Church, she's actually the one that many pray to, so she has a huge reign, okay, so we need to pray for protection, I explain all that to you so we can put protection because that demon hates the no toleration and the, the the decision that Catherine has made to follow Jesus. And I asked her, Catherine, you know you might have to choose Jesus over mom and dad. She's like, oh, that's easy. I'm like, whoa, I like this one. She's like, she said, that's easy. I already chose, you know. I'm like, okay. Now we're going to ask God to give her ability to, because it, it's going to come against her. I, I've lost a lot of Catholic friends. Do you know how many Catholics we'll have here if their parents didn't stop them? You have, you have a, 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 at least a dozen of them here, okay? At least a dozen, I can count them, okay? They can't come. You guys are blessed to be able to come here. Not that we're anything, but it's just... <laughs> I mean, it would suck to want to come to church and your mom has said no and you're stuck. You know? So, how many guys want to see God bless her and give her yes. uh, what she needs to get by, huh? Yes. All right, why don't you come, guy, lay hands, come, come surround her with some love. And just, Lord, we just ask for wisdom and revelation. God, no matter what, God, you are in control of Catherine's life. And Lord, we cancel every curse placed upon her. God, we cancel the power of witchcraft. And Lord, any words that says she's going to hell or she's been deceived, we break the power of deception and the curse of condemnation against her right now in Jesus' name. And God, every uh, spirit that uh, assigned against her, we cancel your assignment and command you to back off leave in the name of Jesus. And God, I just pray your spirit come right now. Just begin to pray the Holy Ghost. Lord, would you rise up in her and come upon her in the name of Jesus. Would you cause her to be a voice? Lord, even to her friends, Lord, would you raise her up, Lord God, even as she goes to her family, she would be the light, Lord. She would not respond out of anger, but Lord, she would just love them and pray for them, Lord. She would call on your name, even when they abuse her verbally, mentally, and emotionally, Lord. She would trust you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You want to declare that you forgive them, Lord? Thank you, Lord. 
So Lord, anything that's in our heart that's been hurt, Lord, everybody just say we release healing in our hearts. Well, everywhere her family has punctured her heart with words, with mean words. I want to declare that you are not received. Okay? I want to declare that um, you have not betrayed your family. That's a lie. And I, I, in the name of Jesus, I set your mind free from, from anything that tells you you're a bad um, member of the family that you you uh, uh, did anything uh, wrong to them, that you have wronged them in any way, you have not wronged them. In the name of Jesus, I break that Thank you, Lord. Now, how do you guys know the price she's paying? It's not easy. Everybody's... I saw something that you were praying for her. Yeah. I saw like a like a match, like a little flame. Mm -hmm. I like a huge baseball bat coming against that. I, it was like bigger than that. I and mean, it was so big, but the flame was not quenched. I and mean, it actually started growing increasingly. Mm -hmm. Lord, just release that flame in her. Yes. Release that flame. She has a